<laughs> Thank you. Wow, finally, I'm here. Well, for you, if, you're, if you're over 40 and live in Whitefish, you might have heard, from me, heard of me. If not, who is this guy up here and what does he have to talk about? Well, three things that kind of define me is, like you mentioned in my intro, I played golf. I played football for 10 years in the NFL. I helped found a non for profit Whitefish Winter Classic 30 years ago, and 10 and 15 years ago, I broke my neck. What Stan asked me to talk today, I said, sure, I can talk. I'm not shy. I've done this a lot. Plus, I got a lot of material. But the material I have is probably what we're going to use today. The TED Talk is a lot different. It's not about re rehashing old football stories. This is about the journey to get here. Um, as a kid, growing up, my parents always kept me active. They kind of believed a good kid was a tired kid. Kind of the same thing I feel about my dogs. <laughs> so they kept me active. I got, did, did a lot of activities. I, I was a Boy Scout, and I loved that. Learned a lot of great stuff. We had to tie knots, first aid. And it's the first time I heard about community service. You heard about you know, the Boy Scout helping the old lady across the street or do a good turn daily. Well, I heard it, but I didn't really get it. I also played a lot of sports. Again, keep a kid busy, right? Baseball, basketball, and football, organized sports for, since I was 12. That's a lot of commitment, a lot of time involved. You know, practice every day after school. You have to go to school, do your homework, and still have time to go to practice afterward. And Saturday morning, your only day off, you got to wake up and go play the game. So it's a big commitment, but it paid off for me. I was lucky enough to have uh, my senior year in, college, in high school. I had some colleges that were looking at me and offered me a full ride scholarship. That was a pretty heavy time for a 17 year old. Here I was, a full ride tuition, books, room and board. I could be completely independent of my parent. As a 17 year old, that's a pretty cool thing. So I got another good thing was I got to go on these recruiting trips and basically get interview different teams, different coaches, and find out what teams, what school suited me best. The last trip I went to was the University of Montana. This is a long time ago. I got off the plane there, and they didn't have jetways. You walk out, and there's Missoula, Montana at your feet. I was just, first time in the mountains, I was just going, wow, you know, mountains, trees. Plus, there's no speed limits in 18 years, drinking age. This place was for me. What more could a kid ask for? <laughs> The last, the first time I said, the first time I got the opportunity to come to Whitefish was my, in 74, my, my freshman year in college, and one of my teammates was from Whitefish, and he had talked about the Winter Carnival, and he wanted to get together a broom hockey team to come up and play. He asked me if I would help him out with it, I said, sure. When he, when he, uh, he also, when he mentioned the fact of the promise of free steak and beer if we won a championship, I was all in. Then that night it blew a good old Montana blizzard, and Woke up the next day to beautiful blue sky, sub-zero weather, but not a puff of breeze, and just one of those beautiful days. We barely was, were able to get out of town over, the, uh, over Evero Hill and driving up I-93, uh, and came around the corner of dropping into uh, St. Ignatius and see the Mission Mountains and the Flathead Valley. It just didn't get much better than that for a kid from the Midwest. I just felt like Montana was just a place that was just home to me. I just, I know it sounds corny and cliche, but it, I just, it was just like I arrived, I was back. I didn't think it was going to get much better, but it did. We won our broom hockey game. We had an awesome day of skiing. And uh, of course, I took advantage of the free beer and steak. That was, uh, that was my first trip to Whitefish. Soon thereafter, uh, my, as, as college concluded, I was, uh, awesome. I was approached by some pro scouts and looked like, like I was going to have the opportunity to play in the NFL. Now, an opportunity to play is not making a team. The competition is fierce. You're playing against teams, kids from all over the country, from the big schools, Texas, Alabama, and here I was from Missoula, Montana, lining up with these guys or competing with them. But at least I was going to get a shot. I was lucky and I got drafted. I, I packed up my car and was head, I was drafted in the sixth round by the Dolphins. I packed up and was heading out. And I stopped by my coach and for his parting words of wisdom, and he said, go down there and play every play like it's the last play, because it might be. 
I took his advice and came on down and arrived in Miami and stepped on the field with these Hall of Fame players and Coach Don Shula. I mean, I was watching these guys on Sunday last year. Here I am on the same field with them. It was a surreal feeling. It was like, you know, I'm not worthy, but here I was. I was very fortunate. I got, I, I got, I, I got to play early, and I impressed the coaches enough to make the team. And I was, I, I arrived. I, my, my dream, and a lot of young men's dream to play in the NFL, it, it happened. I was there. But the best thing about the NFL, besides the fame and fortune, was the fact that you got six months off. So as soon as the season was over, I had escaped the tropics and head on home, hit the slopes. The nice thing about coming back to Montana is that people didn't give a rip about the NFL for the most part. I mean, we care about the Seahawks and things like that these days, but I was kind of, uh, I was just another ski bum. But at 6'7", 260, I did stand out in line a little bit. Couldn't go hiding there. As also why I was back on, these, on my off season, I was approached by a lot of families of people with different hardships. And I'd do what I could. I'd buy a raffle ticket, I'd sign a jersey for the auction. And, but what really stuck out and what was really concerning to me was the families with kids with problems. Now, today we have state-of-art medical facilities here in the Valley. 20, 30 years ago, not so much so. When a, when a family had a major problem with their child, it was usually Doctor, tell them get to big city and get there today because we don't we can't handle it here. So I found a lot of families that were in dire, desperate need to raise some money to get enough gas money, you know, to make it over to Seattle or Spokane. You know, my heart went out to them, and I thought what would be cool is if we could have a, a fund already established, so people wouldn't have to scramble and worry about that kind of de these kind of details and trivials, but be able to just get there and get their kid in the best care as fast as possible. So now the next step was figuring out how to raise these funds. During the off season, I got to travel around a little bit, and one of my trips was to a ski trip down to Steve Out Springs. They had a thing called a Cowboy Downhill. Earlier in that, that week in, uh, down in Denver, they had a big pro rodeo that went on, and they, would, they brought a bunch of these cowboys up to the mountain for this event. These guys, uh, none of them hadn't skied before, and that was part of the charm. And of course, if you jump on a bronc or a bull, you're not too scared of strapping a couple boards on your feet. So they were all in. They would come flying down the hill with their chaps in the wind and their, ha their hats and run through a couple gates. And if they made it to the very bottom, they had to, had to lasso a gal and then throw a saddle on a horse, all with their skis on. The star of the show this bronc rider from Brooklyn, New York, of all places, made it to the bottom, lassoed the girl, pulled her in, gave her a big kiss, ran over to the horse, knocked his, pulls his, punched his skis off, jumped, off the, jumped on the horse and galloped off into the sunset. The crowd loved it, they went nuts. I go, this is cool, this is, so we gotta do kind of an NFL version of the cowboy downhill. So I had my fundraiser, now I just, I knew I needed some help on this one. So, I went and pitched the idea to Larry Delaney, up the marketing director up on the big mountain, and he loved it. He said, let's do it. Larry was an amazing guy. He had some, some experience to draw from, and he was no stranger to events. He worked for Apple Records when the Beatles were there and told me stories about hanging out with Paul and Ringo. Man. And he was an actor and an uh, author, and he worked for the networks doing things like the Battle of Network Stars and the Glen Campbell Open, so this was doable. He said, we, yeah, we can handle this. But we still need a lot of help. And that's when I also learned, I thought, is there really a true form of autism? You know, we still had, we had people that wanted to help. We had sponsors that wanted to help it. You know, they wanted something in return. They wanted some notoriety. They wanted it to be mentioned in advertising or their logo on a banner. The guys wanted to come up. I had plenty of football players that would like to come out, but then when they saw how far it was and how, much it, how expensive the, the ticket worth, the airplane ticket worth was, I found that we, you know, we're going to have to give them, we're going to have to give them free tickets as well. And the people that donated, they wanted to be recognized as well. So, I guess here I do, you know, running a charity, trying to, and I, you know, I'm not guilty. I can't say I was not guilty myself. When Larry asked me what I wanted, I said, you know, how much money you want to do this? And I said, no, you don't have to pay me. I said, how about a, how about a, how about a free pass? I mean, the chair list is running anyway. What's the big deal? I can just jump on. All right, no sweat off you guys, huh? Yeah, no problem. We can handle that part. That's the least of it. So, 
here we are, we're off and running. We invented, a, we invented the Winter Classic. We basically kind of invented the wheel that, that day and it's been rolling, it rolled along well for a number of years. Now without drama and turmoil, there's always fires to put out and, and things to deal with. In 97, we had a kind of a major mutiny on my hands. Some of the board members weren't real happy. They didn't think, uh, they thought they were getting a, the short end of the deal. I was getting a lot more credit than I deserved and they were doing a lot of the work. And they were probably right. You know, I might have slept at the wheel a little bit and got a little complacent, but you know, let's, let's talk about this. How can we work it out? But no, it, it passed that point of no return. They wanted to pull the plug on a classic. Kind of like the spoiled kid that wanted to take his ball and go home, didn't want to play anymore. They said, no, that's not, that's not going to happen. We're going we're gonna to pull this thing off. So I rallied some new troops, got some fresh faces, with some fresh ideas and good energy. <laughs> In we started fresh and pulled it off one more time. In 98, we uh, were planning even bigger and better things. So I, uh, some of, them, some of the uh, events were going to be up on a mountain. So in February, February 5th to be exact, exact um, I was up there meeting with some of the folks. And the nice thing about meeting with people on the mountain is you conduct your, your business right there on the chairlift. So it was a little newer chairlift than that. Uh, I remember, but uh, I am getting pretty old here, so I might have been the one I was riding on. So we were riding up on a chairlift discussing our business. We got done with it, and Adora had to get back to Adora McGavar, who was a regional marketing, the direct marketing person there. She had to get back to the office, and I had to get back home. I had, to, I had a trip the next morning to go to Miami to play a charity golf trip, a golf tournament, and that early six o'clock flight, so oh, oh dark 30 to get to the airport. So I'm, I said, I better get home too. Heading down to the parking lot. Last minute I said, you know what? This ski is pretty good today. I might have to make one more run. So I jumped on the chair, driving up the mountain. I looked down at a fresh corduroy time rigging bowl and said, hey, that's going to be my last run. One more for the day. I got off the lift, pointed the skis down, and started racing along, planning my, packing my bag in my head, you know, Where's my, got my golf clubs are out in the shed. I gotta get my, got my shorts together. And oh, I gotta leave about 4.30. I'm looking down the hill, three, 400 yards. And there's Ma Pa and little kids are just little ducklings kind of going back and forth across the bowl. And no problem, I'm way up there. I'll just, I'll just kind of adjust my line to where they're not gonna be and kept going down. And all of a sudden they kind of stopped. So again, I'm 100 yards away or so. So I kind of averted to the left a little bit and that's when it happened. Got off the court, kind of a flat light day that day. I got off the corduroy and the yard, the yard cell began. Don't remember much of the fall itself. Um, that part of my memory kind of was wiped clean. I've heard that from other people in traumatic injuries. The brain doesn't register that anymore. They just kind of block that out. So probably so you don't have to relive that over and over again. But the next thing I remember was I'm laying on the snow and having trouble getting up. And I couldn't figure that part out. The ski patrol got to me right away and said, you know, stay, don't move, stay tight, don't move. I go, no, really, I'm all right. Just give me a hand up. I don't know what's going on, but I'm having trouble getting up. Well, John Gray was one of the guys I met earlier, ironically, and was a board member with the Classic to, today and a great guy. And John was got on me and was holding me down by my shoulders. Don't move, don't move, just stay still. I go, John, I'm okay, just give me a hand. And really, just stay still, don't move. I go, well, at least straighten my legs out for me then, will you? Because your legs are straight. They're laying flat on the ground, side by side. So then I go, whoa, this isn't good. This is bad. I don't remember much after that. I got loaded on a helicopter and flew off. Got uh, wheeled in the Kalispell Regional. And seven days later, I woke up with a halo on my head. Kind of what that picture is right there I'm looking at. The, they bolt this contraption to your skull and you, uh, that's, uh, I couldn't figure out what that was. I woke up with some little bars on the side of my eyes. I thought I was in jail or something. I was trying to rip that thing off my head. But they had all talked about spinal cord injury and the need for rehab and that there had been some arrangements to go to Miami. And that's when it started to happen. The owner of the Dolphins, I didn't even know, Wayne Izinga, I didn't, he uh, bought the team after he retired, made arrangements to fly his plane up to pick me up. I got down to Miami and did about five months of rehab. 
and I've been through a lot of injuries in my, in my time, so I figured, you know, a couple months I'd get this thing figured out. You know, I'd get off, you know, get out of this chair and back on my feet. Well, it didn't happen. It was uh, kind of an awakening, but I was thinking, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer, I guess. So I headed home. I was tired, you know, ready to get out of the hospital, ready to head home. I missed my house, I missed my dog. I just wanted to get back to Montana. So I headed on back, and that's when it really started happening. The outpouring of support and generosity was just, I can't even begin to tell you what it, was, what it was like. And I don't have time to thank all those people that did so much for me. But it was, a, it was, it was all around me, and it was just amazing. I think that at that time, I kind of realized, you know, what a, a great place to play in this town, but also, what a wonderful place to live. The people have this kind of support. You know, total strangers were helping me out. And I asked one of these guys, why are you doing this? He goes, you know, after all you've done for us, this is the least we can do for you. I said, well, all I can say is thanks. After that, I kind of thought, you know, we canceled the classic that year. But I said, you know, I'm not gonna, it's time to get back on the horse. I can't not help people just because of this injury. I'm going to go, we, gonna, we need to start the classic back up. We're not going to let this happen two years in a row. So time to get back on the horse. Plus what my old coach Don Shuley used to say, anybody can play healthy. So we got it back running. I called the, the, gang, the gang together and we started it back up. And 15 years later, here we are. Next month we have our 29th annual one and we're hoping to do more of what we've done in the past. And that's help families get to get their kids to where they need to get and help with other issues that they might arise. You know, I was thinking about that a lot. Did I need to take that one last run? You know, probably not. I should have probably gone home, but I did. You know, in the blink of an eye, I went from 10 foot tall and bulletproof to somebody that needed help. I was the old lady that needed help across the street. I needed to have help reaching in the top of the aisle of the grocery store, or pick something off the ground, but it's not easy to ask for help. It's really difficult. But the reality was I needed it. So here I am today, and I want to tell you, I thought a lot about what I was going to say today, and I, it's been kind of an exercise in going through this all again. And um, I, I didn't know really exactly where I was going, but two weeks ago, I had to share a story with you to kind of encapsulate this whole thing. I was on my way in the grocery store, it's a cold, rainy day. Imagine, go figure, huh? Whitefish, Montana, cold and rainy. I was wheeling into the store and I got to a little, my hands were wet, my tires were wet, my hands were cold. I made to try to get up over that bump and I couldn't quite make it. So I wheeled, I backed up a little bit and tried again, still no luck. This family, this couple was coming in. The guy said, can I give you a hand? I go, no, I think I got it. One more time, didn't make it. So he goes, let me do something good today. Turn around, reach, give me a little push. And I was on my way. I said, thanks. He said, no problem. I guess it's as simple as that. Let me do something good today. Thank you very much for your time. Cassandra, thank you for allowing me to talk today. And um, good night. Thank you.